Happy New Year, Beatle fans, and welcome to the first edition of Things We Said Today for the year 2021. I'm Dan Aaron DeVivo, I'm from WFUV in New York City, and uh, joining me, uh, as usual, my co-hosts on Things We Said Today, Ken Michaels, uh, an esteemed radio show host who has hosted numerous shows over many decades, shows having to do with the Beatles, of course. Ken's here, and Alan Kozin's here as well. Alan's been writing, uh, uh, a music journalist has been uh, writing books and uh, having his works published in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and many other fine publications. Every other week, I get together with Ken and Alan, and we chat about the Beatles together, solo, things related to the Beatles, sometimes things that have nothing to do with the Beatles, right here on Things We Said Today. And uh, again, welcome to our first show of 2021, uh, a year that uh, promises to be uh, a rather busy one with releases and reissues and whatnot. You'll want to keep tuned here to Things We Said Today to keep up with the latest in what's happening in Beatleland. So uh, without further, further ado, Let's uh, open up the mics to Ken and to Alan. Happy New Year, guys. Hey, happy New, happy New Year, too. Darren. And to all of our listeners. So, was uh, Santa Claus uh, good to you guys and bringing you all kinds of colored vinyl copies of McCartney 3? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were a few. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mine are still trickling in, actually. I got another package today. It's never ending. It's and the, the gift that keeps on giving. Most of these uh, McCartney 3 uh, colored vinyl uh, LPs, other than the white one so far, they don't really tell you on the uh, shrink wrap what color is inside. So I'm making all kinds of detailed notes because, you know, till I get around with open to opening them on uh, what color should be here, where it was purchased, and trying to keep track of all this madness. But uh, before we'll talk more about McCartney three in a couple of seconds. Ken Michaels always gets uh, our show uh, started with uh, Beatle news, so let's throw it over to Ken for that. Okay, thanks, Darren. Well, shoot to your own word. We start with news about McCartney three and its uh, initial success. It debuted in the United States on the Billboard Top two hundred album charts at number two behind Taylor Swift's new album, Evermore. Paul's album had sold 105,000 album equivalent units. That's the term they use. With 102,000 in actual album sales, making it the best-selling album of the week. And it debuted at number one on the top album sales chart. The only difference here between Paul's album and Taylor Swift's is in the streaming where I'm sure Taylor did much better than Paul, and that's what set her over the top at being at number one. Uh, McCartney 3 sold 32,000 vinyl copies through its many variants, uh, 53,000 copies on CD, also 18,000 as digital downloads, and an additional 1,000 copies on cassette. McCartney 3 was also the number one album on the vinyl albums chart, Uh, McCartney is also the first artist to have reached the top two album charts in the last six decades from the 70s to the 20s. We follow that with the non not surprising news, at least not for me, that in its second week, McCartney three has dropped to number 37 on Billboard's top 200. This is what normally happens. All the fans, the loyal fans that know about its release, buy it the first week or two weeks of its release. And because it doesn't get any support, really, from radio, then it's just left to die. And in the case of Egypt Station, Egypt Station debuted at number one, was off the album charts in four weeks. And Mm -hmm. unless um, it gets some kind of promotion on the radio, you can't expect an album like this to have legs to it. And even with all the great reviews that it got, too. So I hope that it stays on the charts longer, but I'm not expecting it. Just taking a look at the pattern of what happens with veteran artists who don't receive airplay on the radio these days. 
just their loyal fan base goes and buys it quickly and that it dies a quick death. I hope it's not the case with this album, but we'll see. In addition, McCartney 3 debuted at number one in the UK on their official albums charts, and it was the first time Paul had a number one album in the UK since Flowers in the Dirt in 1989. And its second week, the album already drops to number 19. Worldwide, McCartney 3 has made the top 10 in most countries, already topping the charts in Germany and on the Dutch charts. Other news about Paul, he and his wife Nancy have been taking time off vacationing in St. Bart, with pictures surfacing of them enjoying the sun and swimming there. As of this moment, you can catch Paul's concert at the Cavern Club from July 26, 2018, when he was promoting his album, Egypt Station. It was recently broadcast on BBC television, and it was professionally shot and is rumored to be released on DVD. For most of the show, Paul is in fine voice. Have either of you seen this concert? No. Al, I, I have it um, sitting on a drive waiting to be seen, but I haven't actually watched it yet, no. It's surprisingly very good. You know, we're, we're always so focusing on Paul's voice these days. Right. There are times when it's shaky. I'm not going to deny that fact. Certain songs like Jet and uh, 1985, it's kind of rough. But there are songs where his voice sounds absolutely wonderful, like mm-hmm. Band on the Run, for example. The band plays really well. I don't know what it is, but when I try to play this off of YouTube, the audio seems really kind of quiet. You really got to boost the level up. And um, sometimes I'm not crazy about the actual mix of this concert because there are times when you struggle to hear Paul's voice. It's blended in so much with the band that you can't hear Paul when they harmonize with him. But otherwise, it's a, it's a very good concert. It's not the entire concert from uh, The Cavern. And there were a few songs they left out. Uh, Letting Go was one of them, Come On To Me, uh, Things We Said Today, and Confidant. I will say, though, this is partly because I've seen Paul so many times that I'm spoiled to the point where, you know, there are certain songs that I've heard him do so much, I wish he'd give it a rest. For me, you know, it, it was a joy to hear the new stuff from Egypt Station. It was refreshing, you know, when you're so used to hearing all the other songs that he does so many times over. But um, if you get a chance, at least as we're doing this show on January 5th, 2021, it's still on YouTube. So try to check it out. Paul at the Cavern Club. In an interview that Paul gave to NPR, he revealed that he talks to George Harrison through a fir tree that George gave Paul shortly before his death in 2001. Paul planted the tree at his estate in East Sussex, and he has watched it grown in the nearly 20 years since George's death. Paul said on the program, All Things Considered, George was very into horticulture, a really good gardener. So he gave me a tree as a present. It's a big fir tree, and it's by my gate. As I was leaving my house this morning, this was on December 11th, I get out of the car, close the gate, and look up at the tree and say, Hi, George. (laughs) There he is, growing strongly. Paul said he feels George's spirit is present in that tree. Okay. Paul's brother Michael and his former group, The Scaffold, have reunited to release a new version of their big hit, Thank You Very Much, as a charity single to benefit the NHS, that's the National Health Service in England, The words were changed to reflect our appreciation of the frontline workers and nurses all tirelessly working while facing this horrible pandemic. You can find their new video under the title, Thank You, that's the letter U, Thank You Very Much for the NHS. And on the YouTube page, there's a link to download the single and to make a charitable contribution. Really nice gesture there and fits really well with the song, as you can imagine. Speaking of Imagine, to kick in the new year at 12 midnight, singer Andra Day sang John's song Imagine as heard on CNN. Andra plays Billie Holiday in a new movie called The United States versus Billie Holiday. The late Chris Cornell covers John Lennon's song Watching the Wheels 
and an upcoming posthumous album for him called No One Sings Like You Anymore. The album has Chris covering songs from Prince, ELO, Terry Reid, Guns N' Roses, and more. A new lyric video has just been made for Cornell's version of Watching the Wheels. You can stream that album now with physical copies available in March. Okay. Also, the musical group The Kennedys have been doing live concert streams since the pandemic began. And all this month, they are doing shows of just Beatles songs. They started on January the 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, which you can watch live as it goes out. And then it stays on their YouTube channel. Each week, they they tackle music from two years in a row of Beatle music, and, and they will be working their way chronologically each week. So their first show of Beatle songs, January 3rd, they covered music from 1963 and 64, January 10th at 2 p.m. It's 1965 and 66, and so on. If you're interested in watching, just go to their YouTube channel. That's the band, The Kennedys. Okay. Uh, we note the passing of Israeli virtuoso violinist Ivry Gitlis, a classical violinist who played with the Plastic Max as part of the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. The band made up of John and Yoko, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, and Mitch Mitchell from the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Uh, while the band performed Your Blues for this event, they also performed Yoko's song, Whole Lot of Yoko, which had Gitlis playing with them. Thanks to the folks from the Nothing Is Real podcast for this information. You know more about Ivory, Alan. Uh, why don't you pass that along? Yeah, I mean, not an awful lot. I mean, he was um, in the 60s. He was sort of beginning to make a career for himself. And, uh, you know, you see him in the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus video. That whole lot of Yoko is, you know, it's basically a jam. And, you know, he's fiddling away. Uh, he was sort of, you know, young enough to sort of catch the spirit of that. But, um, you know, his the main part of his career was really in classical music. I think he played some jazz, too. Um, he, he never got extremely famous in the U.S., um, even in Europe. Uh, you know, people knew who he was. I never actually saw him play live. Uh, so I, I don't know an enormous amount about him. Um, I, I would say, generally speaking, he's probably certainly to us and our listeners are probably most famous for his interaction with John Yoko, Eric Clapton, Keith Richards, and Mitch Mitchell in that one concert. Yeah, well, not quite a concert. So he was mainly <laughs> he was mainly well known in Israel then. I think probably yeah. And, and a bit in Europe, yeah. I mean, even a bit here. I mean, people knew who he was, but he didn't. He didn't tour an awful lot in the U.S. So, uh, and uh, the, there aren't a lot of recordings either. So, so that was really his big moment. Okay. All right. Well, finally, we note that it's a very difficult time for those those of us who love the British invasion music of the 60s. We just noted the passing of Chad Stewart of Chad and Jeremy. And on January the 3rd, we learned that Jerry Marsden has also passed away. Jerry was the lead singer of Jerry and the Pacemakers. The group scored many big hits in the 60s, the biggest in the U.S. being Ferry Cross the Mersey and Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying. The group's version of the classic song, uh, You'll Never Walk Alone, from Carousel, was not only a number one song in the U.K., but it became the anthem for the Liverpool Football Club. He had many connections to the Beatles, having been the next act that Brian Epstein signed following the Fab Four, and George Martin produced their early records. When George Martin wanted the Beatles to record How Do You Do It as their first single, they reluctantly recorded it, but wanted their original material on their singles instead. George Martin gave in to their request and offered the song to Jerry and the Pacemakers to record, and that became their first hit. And it also went to number one in the UK. The Beatles were friends with Jerry and the band, and there was even one day, October 19th, 1961, when both bands were joined on stage, and uh, they called themselves the Beat Makers. <laughs> and this was at Litherland Town Hall in Liverpool. There are photos you can find of both bands together, even one where they're posing with Roy Orbison. 
And uh, in 1989, Jerry redid the song Ferry Cross the Mersey as a charity single to benefit the victims of the Hillsborough disaster, which happened at a football stadium in which 96 people were crushed to death. And Paul McCartney helped out with this recording, singing quite a bit in that version, which raised a lot of money for the cause. And it was also a number one record in the UK. Paul issued a statement on Jerry's passing. Jerry was a mate from our early days in Liverpool. He and his group were our biggest rivals on the local scene. His unforgettable performances of You'll Never Walk Alone and Ferry Cross the Mersey remain in many people's hearts as reminders of a joyful time in British music. My sympathies go to his wife, Pauline, and family. See you, Jerry. I'll always remember you with a smile. And Ringo sent out his statement, God bless Jerry Marsden. Peace and love to all his family. Jerry died after a short illness following a heart infection. Do you guys want to comment just a little bit about uh, Jerry Marsden? It seems as though uh, it was very quick, from what I understand, um, Jerry getting sick and, and passing away and the family being devastated. Uh, when I was uh, just picking around some facts that I shared on Facebook a couple of days ago, I didn't realize that they jumped out of the gate rather quickly, Jerry and the Pacemakers did, with three consecutive number one hits. Mm -hmm. This is in the UK. And I didn't realize that, you know, they came out of the gate really fast. They went to number one with, how do you do it? I like it. You'll never walk alone. And then I'm the one reached two. So they almost had a fourth consecutive number one hit. And it was much slower, of course, here in the United States where they uh, only had, uh, what is it, three, I think three songs reach our top ten. But right. uh, don't think I realized how big they were in the United Kingdom uh, and had uh, those three consecutive number ones and almost a fourth. But uh, they were always a favorite of mine coming out of that whole Mersey Beat scene, and it was very sad to hear that uh, that Jerry is gone, and I played on WFUV last night, you'll never walk alone. Um, so, you know, rest in peace, Jerry Marsden. Yeah. Alan, any thoughts? Um, you know, I always like those records. Uh, they never get quite, you know, became the kind of group that the Beatles became, uh, you know, at the time in, in say 63 or so, they were, uh, much closer, you know, um, Jerry could do a, a credible account of, of how do you do it. I mean, I thought the Beatles one was credible too, but, uh, but, it, but he was willing. Uh, and, it, and it seemed actually in a way, I think, we, you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, as we look back at that, we see the Beatles saying, well, you know, we have a specific thing we want to do when we don't want to do that. And Jerry mm. being a more commercial kind of guy, you know, wanting the hit. I also I can't remember what their their, their film was called, but I, I've I've seen it and it's uh, Ferry Cross the Mersey. Uh, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> that's, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know it, it was it was okay. I mean I I didn't see it until way way later, uh, and and so I was sort of looking back at, as a you know anthropologist almost you know, and looking at this sort of you know Liverpool group movie thing and it's it's not quite a hard day's night i mean in fact there's a, a huge gap between hard day's night and that um mm -hmm. but uh but you know it was sort of enjoyable and they played and it was you know the old jukebox movie thing but yeah you know i mean he he in one way didn't have the kind of endurance that the beatles had in in the sense that you know they went that whole path from please please me to abbey road developing all the way and jerry and and the pacemakers petered out a bit before that and yet they were there you know they were he, he hmm. was always turning up playing and uh you know he he seemed like he was uh you know what what they call a goodwill ambassador you know i mean he seemed to be always out there sort of as the the face of the Liverpool band scene that stayed in Liverpool, didn't go to London, didn't get, you know, musically ambitious the way the Beatles did and others, although not many others from Liverpool, but 
so yeah, I mean, he was definitely part of the ecosystem, let's say, and uh, and and I I always enjoyed his stuff. Yeah, I mean, around that time of 1964, here in the states, anyway, I know it was earlier in the UK, but uh, there was that flood of British invasion groups mm-hmm. uh, that came out and into '65, and there was so much great music, and um, you know, I remember hearing "Ferry Across the Mersey" and. Don't let the sun catch you crying, and those those songs really have stayed with me my whole life as mm-hmm. favorites. And I love the sound of Jerry's vocals on them. But um, there's actually a bit of a similarity, <laughs> in a weird way, between uh, the Beatles and Jerry and the Pacemakers. In that, as we just noted, the story about how do you do it being a song that the Beatles didn't want to release as their first single because they wanted to to go out with original songs, and then Jerry had a number one hit with it in the UK. Well, as Darren just said, the first two songs there, How Do You Do It and I Like It, went to number one. And George Martin and Brian Epstein offered Hello Little Girl to Jerry and the Pacemakers. Mm -hmm. And Jerry said, because the the first two songs were up-tempo songs, he really wanted the next song to be something slow, more like a ballad. So he turned down Hello Little Girl, although... The group did record it. Mm -hmm. So the song that he chose was You'll Never Walk Alone, which went to number one. So in the case of both the Beatles refusing How Do You Do It and going with their own original material and Jerry and the Pacemakers going with You'll Never Walk Alone, their instincts proved to be right on both counts. There's no telling if Hello Little Girl would have been a number one song for Jerry and the Pacemakers. But because Jerry turned it down, then... George Martin and Brian Epstein offered it to the foremost and their version of the song became a top 10 hit in mm-hmm. the UK. So it was still a successful song anyway, but it's just interesting that both groups stuck up for themselves <laughs> mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, said they wanted to record a certain song or their own material in the case of the Beatles. And it both worked in both cases. They proved to be right in their instincts. <laughs> so I find that whole aspect really fascinating. And by the way, that version of Hello Little Girl from Jerry and the Pacemakers is on a compilation that came out in 1991 of uh, the best of Jerry and the Pacemakers, if you want to check that out. So, yeah, but I always loved Jerry's voice. I loved, he did a cover version of the song I'll Be There, which is a Bobby Darren song. Bobby did it first and Bobby wrote it. And I love, 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 love. Uh, the Jerry and the Pacemakers version of that song. And, uh, you know, Jerry's voice really helped to carry those songs. That's really sad, you know, losing two key members of the British invasion all within a span of a few weeks. Yeah. So so back to you, Darren. All right, Ken, thank you very much. And uh, now on to the uh, meat and potatoes of this edition of Things We Said Today. A month ago, uh, even more than that, uh, going back to November, we really never had the opportunity to acknowledge uh, the 40th anniversary of John and Yoko's Double Fantasy album, uh, released in November 1980. Um, So better late than never. We kept discussing through December, uh, uh, through my battle with COVID-19, the fact that we really should discuss the 40th anniversary of Double Fantasy and, of course, the 40th anniversary of John Lennon's murder. And I think Double Fantasy is a good example of an album where, um, over time, uh, the opinions about the record have really changed drastically uh, from what I remember uh, when the album first came out to the way it's uh, you know, regarded today here in the 21st century. So... Uh, So for today's show, uh, we're going to take a look at Double Fantasy, 40 years later, the album from John Lennon and Yoko Ono. So I guess I already revealed one of the initial impressions. One of the initial thoughts I have about the album is how the reaction to the album today is very different from um, what happened in 1980 when I vaguely remember and I was still, uh, yeah, I was 15 years old. And what I remember long, long before the age of the Internet and all kinds of music publications, the reaction to Double Fantasy 
was leaned on the negative side, which I remember disappointed me when the album came out. You know, when you're 15 years old and you don't have, you know, an income and you have to rely on, you know, a gift, uh, Christmas was coming, Santa Claus. You know, I didn't have Double Fantasy right away. You know, I didn't get it until Christmas time. So, you know, I was going by these few reviews I heard and word of mouth that it was such a disappointment. And I remember how much I enjoyed the album when I finally did get it that Christmas. So I asked the two of you, what were your initial reactions, A, to the reactions of the general public, including uh, music journalists, and your initial reaction, if you remember the first time you heard Double Fantasy, especially if it was before John's murder. And I guess we'll, <laughs> I guess we'll start off with, uh, let's go in alphabetical order. Uh, let's start <laughs> off with Alan. <laughs> no, you go in order of age, too, I suppose. <clears throat> you know, oddly enough, I, I mean, I wasn't I've, going there. <laughs> I, I've read about how the reaction was so negative to it, but I don't remember that. Um, and it wasn't like I wasn't paying attention to it because I remember being very excited by, you know, first the rumors that he was recording again and then, you know, the, the news that an album was actually going to come out. I mean, uh, you know, he hadn't done one for five years and, uh, and, and basically the most that we knew was that he had said, you know what, I've done my thing. Uh, I don't really have to do anything anymore. And he had fundamentally retired. And I think everybody, or at least a lot of people had, had more or less accepted that, okay, that's the way it is. And we, you know, might as well respect his, um, his desire to do that. He has given us enough in a way. So when the album came out, uh, I was sort of right on it and, um, and, and loved it from the start. And I don't remember the negative reaction, but you know, it could also be that, um, you know, the events as one might say, you know, very, what was it like three weeks after it was released, he was shot. Right. And, and that kind of, in a way, reset everything in such a big way that maybe I've just put out of my mind any negative reviews or, or anything I'd, I'd read. I mean, I must have read them. I mean, it was, it was a journalist already at the time I was keeping up with what other people did. I just don't that's remember it being that negative. That's um, what I was going to ask you, Alan. In 1980, at this point, had your career as a journalist started at that point? Yeah, I've been writing since um, the mid to late 70s. And um, okay. uh, the first thing I did for the Times was 77. So so, yeah, I was sort of maneuvering into a position where, you know, I could become the Beatles desk or something, but but it hadn't happened yet. You know, I was still really freelancing right. and classical. But I, I remember going to get the record and uh, really liking watching the wheels. Uh, that that to me was sort of the centerpiece of the whole album. But I but I liked all of it. And I liked the dialogue between, you know, John and Yoko, the fact that in a lot of cases, these songs really did seem to answer each other. Uh, and, and I thought that was, was kind of a cool effect. Also, I thought Yoko's songs were, were really not bad at all. And, uh, you know, I mean, she can, this is one thing that happened a little bit after that, you know, when that album, Every Man Has a Woman came out that mm -hmm. I think John right. had arranged as a, a birthday present and Elvis Costello, all kinds of people covering her stuff. You know, what was immediately clear to me was that these were really good songs. I mean, you could dislike her voice if you wanted, and I can totally understand why people did. But if you get past that and listen to them as songs, they were really quite good. And, and that album, I thought, did a great job of proving that. Um, but that was later, you know, like like two or three years later. Uh, on this, I, I just thought it. I just thought it all worked. I thought the, the it went back and forth seamlessly. I was not one of these people who, you know, made a cassette of just John songs <laughs> and listened to that. Mm -hmm. I, I I sort of thought, okay, this is their intention, you know, and it also does seem to work. So when I put it on, I just played it straight through. 
And also, uh, you know, another thing that was, was kind of interesting is I, a few years later, met this guy who he, he had approached me because he wanted to do some collecting and didn't know quite where to start um, with unreleased stuff. And he had heard through, he knew my sister and he had heard basically some stuff that I had and he really wanted to get some of it. And, you know, and I was pretty free with just giving people things, you know, it didn't have to be a trade. A trade was cool if, if, if someone had something, but he calls up and says, the one thing I have that you might want is this autograph double fantasy. And I said, what, you know, I mean, <laughs> And he said, yeah, you know, I was walking down the street on 8th Avenue and I saw John and Yoko and we were just walking past a record store. So I darted into the record store, took the album, threw a $10 bill at the cashier and went out and had him sign it. And, you know, and I said, well, you know, that's a little crazy. You really don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> you really don't want to trade that for copies of tapes that I have, you know, it's just, and he, you know, the, so I, I thought I had talked him out of that and was just going to, you know, make him some compilations of stuff. And he called the next day and, and he faxed me the picture of the back cover where it's autographed. And he calls up and says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said about the, the cover. And I said, well, it's nice. It's really nice. Um, and he said, no, but I mean about a trade. And I said, look, you, you totally don't want to do this. Well, you know, after a while of telling him that, I thought, okay, finally, I have done my duty in, you know, telling him that he doesn't want to do this. And if he absolutely does want to do this, I'll give him a whole lot of stuff. But it will never be worth what that is. And I said, yeah. but why would you do this? And he said, well, I have another autograph John Lennon album it's Imagine and I said well did you see him autograph it and he said no I bought that you know <laughs> I bought that at an auction and I said but you saw him do this you have a story you have the whole thing and he said yeah but I like the Imagine one better I said, okay fine so you know now we hear that there are maybe 10 autograph double fantasies in the world <laughs> so that's my other double fantasy story, not having anything to do with the music itself, but it's a very cool thing, I got to say. So you have that? So you copy? do have it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It now lives with me in and, Maine. And did they just sign it? <laughs> <laughs> did they just sign it or did they personalize it to this guy? No, it's just signed. It's just signed. And only John signed it. Yoko didn't. Um, I did fax it to Mark Lewison, um, who at the time was doing uh, authentications of autographs for Sotheby's. Uh, and he looked at it and said, yeah, that's, that looks real to me. Uh, and I didn't doubt the guy, actually. You know, he, he wasn't like, you know, a huckster type. He was just, you know, some guy who wanted some tapes and had that. And uh, mm. gave him a lot of tapes, got to say, and upgraded him for a while when better versions turned up, but, uh, you know, now, now he lives out in Nevada or something like that. So, um, we're, we're, we're still vaguely in touch, but, uh, huh. but that was a, that was a very cool event. I got to say. Did Yoko sign it too? No, just John. I don't okay. know if he didn't ask Yoko or she didn't feel like it or what, but, uh, you know, I don't know how long they wanted to be interrupted standing on eighth Avenue too. Um, right. So, so there it is. I mean, that, that that transaction must have been really fast. He sees John and Yoko coming towards him. Yep. And he happens to be right near a record store. Yep. Runs in, gets the album, and gets outside. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he just took the album and threw the money at the... He didn't, like, you know, wait to pay in a, you know, relaxed way. He just he, he knew right. he had to catch right. him. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't know at the time that there were only 10 of them, although I didn't think there'd be that many because it was only three weeks, you know, but still, uh, when I found out there was 10, I thought, wow, that's incredible. And maybe there were 11 because whoever calculated the 10 probably didn't know about mine. <laughs> right. Where did you hear the figure 10? 
A few years ago, um, I think one went up for auction and in, in the description, uh, it, it talked about there being only, you know, 10 known copies. Mm. That's interesting. You would okay. think there would be more since really? it was so visible uh, outside the Dakota. So many people supposedly waited to meet him, mm. maybe get an autograph. And it was the new album at the time. Yeah, you would uh, think. There, there must be others out there that you will never know about. Could be. Sure. Could anyway, be. he said he only had a few weeks to do this. So, yeah. Uh, your Your initial thoughts, Ken? I was absolutely thrilled i was on a cloud when this album came out and one thing that you got to remember is that back in the 70s it was common practice for every major artist really for the most part to put out an album every single year and you got used to it if for an artist to take a couple of years off was rare so when john left the public spotlight when he chose to do that um, I would always hear these rumors that John is back in the studio and he's working on a new album and I would get my hopes up and nothing would happen. And when I heard in 1980 that that was about to happen, I didn't want to get my hopes up again. But when more word came out in the press about it to make it really official, I was starting to believe it. And I was working at a record store at the time. And when the single for Starting Over came out and we got it in the store, you can imagine what I felt like holding that 45, waiting five years, yeah, almost six years, really, for the first record from John, you know. And um, I loved the single initially. Uh, it took me one or two listens, and I was hooked on the single. I do remember there being some negative reviews, mainly that that Yoko stuff sounded more cutting edge. It was more modern, whereas John's stuff sounded like it hadn't changed since he last left the studio. And that didn't even seem to bother me because John's songs to me were so strong. And like um, like Alan said, I love the dialogue between the two of them. I never did what some people might do and and just record John's songs and put it on a tape and only listen to John's stuff. I listened to both of them back to back. And in a way, you know, this was nothing new. They did the same thing on Sometime in New York City, mm -hmm. bouncing back and forth between each other's songs. But um I felt that John's stuff was so incredibly strong. I do remember when I heard Watching the Wheels, which I, to this day, think it's one of the best songs he ever wrote. But the first time I heard that song and I heard the piano chords, and I'm pretty sure it's in the, the key of C, very much like Imagine. That's mm -hmm. where my mind went as soon as I heard those first few chords of Watching the Wheels. So I can understand how some people would say, well, it's, it's a throwback to what John's music was like before he left the music industry so um but that didn't bother me at all and i loved hearing i'm losing you going into i'm moving on those two songs seg together so perfectly and uh you know you, you had all those people out there the the yoko bashers who didn't want to hear yoko stuff but at the same time you're getting all this positive positive stuff in the, in the press about yoko's music and i'm listening to it I'm hearing songs like Kiss, 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 and I'm saying this isn't too far removed from like um, uh, Move On Fast or one of those songs that she did in the 70s. So, yeah, all of a sudden her stuff is starting to sound contemporary, which just goes to tell you that a lot of what she did in the 70s and the early part of the 70s was pretty much ahead of its time stylistically. Mm. So, yeah, I like the album from the from the get go. And I've never been disappointed by it. I know there are a lot of people who like to make that that uh, analogy of, you know, here's John. He's a happy man now. He's married. It's about domestic bliss. The kind of stuff that they were critical of Paul for <laughs> the very beginning of his solo career. But if that's how he was, he was honest and he was saying how he felt at the time. And I love the fact that there was so much publicity surrounding the album and he was doing a lot of interviews and I couldn't wait to hear John's voice on any interview because it had been so long since we heard from him. So I was thrilled when the album came out. I've never been disappointed by this album at all. And those seven songs I really look at as being, you know, chestnuts in, in uh, John's solo career. Mm -hmm. I know you, you once said, Alan, and I always remember this, 
that if you took John's songs from Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey and made it one album, that could be the best solo album of John's of John's career. <laughs> and I kind of I kind of believe that. But still, when I listen to Double Fantasy, there's no way that I won't listen to it without going back and forth between John and Yoko stuff because yeah. that's how they envisioned it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the intention. I mean, it's, we we hear a lot now, I mean certainly from Ringo about how nobody listens to albums anymore, but um but in those days we did and that was uh it, it's it's nice when an album had some structure and uh, intention and uh and and that definitely was one uh you know, we, you got the sense that like the Beatles on their albums it was carefully sequenced and uh, I'm not saying the Beatles were the only ones to do that, but, uh, you know, this was, a, I, I thought, a really, really well-crafted piece of work. And that song for song, they were quite good. I, I was thinking, it's funny, I forgot having said that about, you know, John's songs from Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey um, possibly being his best album. Because uh, I, I was thinking this afternoon, I, I wonder if this actually is his best album or not. Because when, when I hear it, I think it is. But when I hear uh, Imagine and Plastic Ono Band, I think they are too. You know, it, it's, uh, it, it's hard to pick out from him what's the best. It's easy to pick out what was the worst. For me, that's sometime in New York City. And my feeling hearing this was a little bit like my feeling hearing mind games, you know? I mean, after some time in New York City, I was actually really pretty disappointed. I kind of thought that he might be losing it, you know? And so, you know, hearing mind games was, I was, you know, driving along uh, when I was in college uh, and heard it in the car and thought, wow, he's back. This is good, you yeah. know? So this was was in some ways the same kind of feeling, you know. You turn on the radio and hear "Starting Over" or "Watching the Wheels," and it's wow, that's that's good stuff. And it's what what you said about the um, the negative reaction being that Yoko's stuff was more cutting edge and that John's was old fashioned. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that didn't bother me because old fashioned John to me was you know still up in the zenith of Western Civ area, so. You know, <laughs> it's like not like I'm going to turn my nose up at that. Yeah. So. You know, li listening to your the two of you. And uh, again, um, as I've pointed out in the past, I'm uh, the youngest of the three of us. Uh -huh. Rub but it in. Hearing, <laughs> <laughs> listening to your, your recollections, um, I'm sort of envious because you, you, you came upon the album's release with a um, more knowledge than I had at the time. And I was at the mercy of what I would hear word of mouth, whether that be in school from classmates or people that I know. I didn't have, I didn't really have any fellow Beatle maniac friends. I was, I, I often joke around that growing up in the seventies, uh, my grammar school, it was uh, each class would be, half Kiss fans, half disco fans. And mm -hmm. then there was Darren, who was into Paul McCartney and Wings and the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this because I'm, I'm a, such a proponent of Yoko today, but I do remember the uh, generalizations made about Double Fantasy. Oh, it's half Yoko stuff and it's not any good. And uh, letting that affect my opinion and maybe even uh, dump water on my excitement about a new John Lennon album coming. I do remember hearing start, uh, just like starting over on the radio for the first time I was in the car and thought that's a great song but again as I pointed out a little while ago, I'm 15 years old, I'm at the mercy of handouts from my parents or from you know my grandparents from money so you know you bought records when you were able to find enough quarters on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, wasn't able to buy starting over at that point. And when the album came out again, I it was not really a priority for me at that time. And, you know, uh, I mean, I'm an only child. Christmas time would roll around, you know, it would always be, um, I'd make a list of things uh, that I wanted for Christmas, give them to my, to my mother um that was sort of my letter to santa quote unquote and i don't think i even asked for double fantasy that year but it just so happened that 
my parents went Christmas shopping the day after John's murder, December 9th. And my mo- I, I vaguely remember my mother telling me when she arrived at the record store at the mall to pick up, you know, my gifts to buy my, you know, the stuff I'd asked for. I mean, they had moved all of the John Lennon records and Double Fantasy was brand new to the front of the store. And it was her hunch that, you know what, it's not on this list, but he's going to want this album, mm-hmm. you know, and she bought she bought Double Fantasy for me. And I don't remember over the course of December, I want to, that's a little poem for you folks. I don't remember over the course of December, uh, my views on the album. I just know that after his passing, I recall hearing a lot of John songs on the radio before you know, Woman was released as a single and watching the wheels uh, probably on in New York City on WNEWFM. I would venture to say they were playing almost all seven of John's songs, you know, on the radio. And I like them all. So I'm sure at some point I would have gotten double fantasy. But come Christmas morning, 1980, there it was. And um, from that point on and having the album myself and being able to form, formulate my own opinion it's always been one of my favorite John and Yoko albums. Although I will admit, being rather young, only child, living with my folks, three-room apartment, the end of Kiss, Kiss, Kiss was rather embarrassing <laughs> to be playing on the stereo. <laughs> so I tended to always like do my own little home fade out with the volume knob uh, until it was over and move on then uh, into what was the cleanup time. The next yep. track. And at the top, when we started this d- discussion, my perception of double fantasy was one of coming from a negative place, negative word of mouth uh, reviews and opinions about the album. And today, double fantasy is almost universally well regarded. I do get angry when I hear any negative Yoko stuff about her seven songs. And I also when you occasionally stumble upon an opinion, for example, on Facebook about people feeling that uh, John was too domesticated on Double Fantasy, that really angers me, that view. You know, there wasn't any give me some truth and power to the people uh, type songs on Double Fantasy. You know, and it's like now I'm older and I totally get the scene and get the scenario and all of that. I'm like, he was they were in their 40s. They were parents. You know, you you weren't necessarily, you know, doing the rebellious stuff that you did just years earlier, because I I see every once in a while those types of uh, skeptical opinions about John's material on Double Fantasy, that he was too domesticated. And, you know, it just it makes me cringe, especially and the criticisms of Yoko stuff. But again, the you know, I was a kind of. uh, I didn't have that initial uh, opinion of Double Fantasy as its release approached and finally arrived in November 80. If you look at the track list um, and, you know, and listen to the the songs themselves, I mean, the other thing is that we were sort of starving for information about what exactly John has been up to. And this is a very autobiographical album and it, you know, even even beginning it with just like starting over. I mean, it, it's as what a great way to begin an album that you're putting out after five years of not doing anything. And we were hearing his interviews at the time. You know, Newsweek had one. Um, uh, the Playboy one, I, I think, came out a little later because it was the January issue. Mm. So I'm not sure when in December it turned up. But uh, you know, and that was that was a huge statement but the songs themselves you know uh the reporter who did the newsweek interview barbara graustark who later became the art editor at the times she went on wnew and played some of her tapes of the interview and i remember recording that and uh and listening and you know you could hear him already saying you know through 
dealing in a way with the people who thought it was too throwbacky, calling starting over, uh, you know, his Elvis Orbison number, you know, so it was, mm. you, you could see what he wanted, but also, you know, okay, starting over, uh, not just his career, but the song itself is, is really a song to Yoko and uh, clean up time, you know, that's, a lot of these songs have to do with issues that came up during their, you know, that five years we weren't seeing him and the fact that Sean was born and, you know, he's represented in there in Beautiful Boy, the back and forth with I'm losing you and I'm moving on. And, and, uh, every man has a woman, uh, you know, of which there are, you know, two versions, because John did one for for that record I mentioned of the covers. So, and woman as well, you know, you, you have his, this is a long way from, you know, I used to be cruel to my woman and beat her, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and kept her apart from the things that, that she loved. I mean, in, in, in a way, it, it's hard not to hear this one, this song, Woman, um, you know, without sort of reflecting back on, you know, the distance he'd come. Um, so, you know, this was an album that told us an awful lot about what he was thinking, what they were both thinking and what they were doing. And that was something that we really, uh, you know, those of us who were that into this, that we really desperately wanted to know in 1980. You know, so in a way, that was another attraction of it. Apart from that, they were just, they were good songs. Um, I thought that the, the fact that they were also letting us into uh, a bit of his life and his thought process, you know, also reflected in the interviews, but, but this was a good start. Those are good points there. Did, did either one of you um, make any comparisons to how Just Like Starting Over opened the album and how mother opened John Lennon Plastic Ono Band a decade earlier. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never thought about that. Versus... You know, when it first came out, that never even occurred to me until John right. brought it up. Yeah, John did. Interview. I had never heard, <laughs> at, at that point, I had I had never heard Mother. And I didn't own the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album yet. So it was actually, I remember, uh, I think in the months following his death, I had some Christmas money, I guess, or birthday money. And I remember buying John Lennon Plastono Band, Imagine, sometime in New York City and possibly rock and roll. Uh, and it was the first time I'd heard those albums. But, uh, I mean, Alan, for your ears, when you not necessarily heard just like starting over for the first time, because initially it was just a single. But then when you became aware of the fact it was going to be open double fantasy, did you make any connection between the uh, maybe subliminal message John was sending out by opening double fantasy this way with chimes, as opposed to the creepy tolling of the funeral bells a decade earlier. Yeah. I don't remember that I did. Um, I, I do remember hearing John talk about it, but I don't know that I had made that connection before he mentioned it. I mean, I, I'd like to say and that I did, but I didn't. <laughs> And Ken, you knew the song Mother and John Lennon Plastic Ono Band at that time, right? Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, but I didn't connect. Again, because those. my co-hosts are older than me, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think it's really important what Alan just talked about. Um, if you think about it, yes, this is a very autobiographical album. And it's John and Yoko telling you what their lives are like at that moment, the good and the bad. And it's not... Like when you hear I'm losing you going into moving on, that is not a couple that's getting along there. I mean, it wasn't no. a perfect relationship and they're being honest about it. And at the same time, if you listen to Just Like Starting Over, which more than ever makes perfect sense to be the lead off song on the album. You know, John did say that he looked at his life at that moment as though it had just started, like nothing else happened before that. It's him and Yoko moving forward together as a couple this is how it all begins. He's wiping the slate clean. And that's, you know, cleanup time is very much, you know, the same message. So um, right. it's really, uh, it, it's a fascinating, John always was extremely personal. He was always telling you where his head was at, at that moment, throughout all of his solo albums, whether he was thinking politically, 
with the songs on Sometime in New York City. Or, you know, you listen to um, Walls and Bridges and there are songs there that deal with the struggle of a, of a relationship with Yoko. You know, I think of Bless You that way. So, you know, John was always extremely personal in all of his music. No different on Double Fantasy. But uh, and Woman, I mean, that that could be my favorite Lennon song of all time. It's just so beautiful in its in its melody and in the arrangement and in all the harmonies. And I always remember from the very beginning, you know, calling it the Beatle track because <laughs> it does sound like yeah. it could have been a Beatle song. And uh, yeah, it's that's such a brilliant piece of work. And um, that, along with watching the wheels, I think, are two of the best songs he's ever written. And to write something for Sean like Beautiful Boy reminded me of him writing Good Night for Julian at the same age for both of them, too. So, yeah, I mean, in many ways, this album is painful because we associate it with John's murder. But because, as always, he was so personal in his in his music, he knew exactly where his head was at at this moment. It makes it, you know, even more painful to listen to, especially considering the fact that at least based on everything that he said in his interviews, he was so happy at that moment, you know, in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you guys think of the stripped down version? I love it. <laughs> I never realized how much double tracking makes a difference in the vocals because, uh, you know, and I realized that with some of the Beatles stuff that I've listened to, you know, how much more raw and intense it could be when it's just, you know, one single vocal that's used in the song. It sounds certainly much more alive. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say that I like it better than the version that we know of Double Fantasy because some people prefer stripped down now. Mm -hmm. um, just like they prefer Let It Be Naked. Some people prefer that over Let It Be. It's the same idea in a way. You know, a lot of people like less polish, you know, and everything being more raw mm -hmm. that way. And, uh, you know, maybe less production, take away some of the, uh, the brass in some cases. And it has a totally different vibe that way, like you're really in the studio with John. Mm -hmm. And Yoko, I think it, the songs are. Mm -hmm. I think it reduces the distance between John's stuff and Yoko's stuff in terms of being cutting edge. I mean, without all the production, there's there's lots of sort of raw stuff on John's songs too that make it uh, a, a much more modern sounding album than it did at the time. In a way, uh, you know, I like it a lot. I, I listen to it today and. Uh, but that said, I, I doubt that I've listened to it 10 times in the 10 years it's been out. Just because, you know, I, I was perfectly happy with Double Fantasy as it was. And I, I, I'm always interested in hearing alternate mixes. So, you know, that was fine. Uh, and I thought, it was, I thought it was well done. And I thought it showed lots of aspects of those songs that were more buried and hidden on the fully produced record, but, uh, you know, I don't see it supplanting the, uh, uh real one as one might call it in the way that, uh, you know, and, and I don't think that, uh, a, a stripped down, all things must pass will necessarily supplant the original either. I just think that it would be good to hear. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I think, I think that you that... both know my, my feelings about this because we even talked about this briefly with McCartney three, how a lot of fans now are preferring less production, less influence from producers on the music of the solo Beatles. So, um, yeah, I love Stripped Down, don't get me wrong, but it, it can't take the place of the way Double Fantasy first came out, much the same way that All Things Must Pass, Cloud Nine, so many of McCartney's albums that had producers, I like them the way they came out. I like Stripped Down versions too, but probably not as much as the original versions. Yeah, I like what you said, Ken, about the fly on the wall feeling that you get uh, from the stripped down double fantasy, because I mean, I, I think it was a fantastic job Jack Douglas did with the main album, mm. uh, the production that was done on the main album so that, you know, providing us with an alternate way to listen to it was more just that an alternate way. But a lot of it was. You know, when I listen to the stripped down version, it gives me an opportunity to really pay attention to the musicians 
Um, mm-hmm. And it was a really good band. I, I think it's easy to, to to overlook how good the band was that Jack Douglas assembled to right. play on Double Fantasy. Uh, and you really get to enjoy the musicians uh, on the stripped down version. And yet, you know, the main version, the regular version was done so well that you can't possibly supplant that. Uh, so they, you know, in my book, they they uh, equally coexist with each other. It just depends on my mood. Hear it as it usually, you know, as it should be heard. Or let's kind of let's pay a visit to the recording studio mm. where John and Yoko and, you know, and, uh, you know, when their band. I didn't realize what a really cool guitar. Well, I guess I did when I met him at the Fest for Beatles fans. But I don't think I ever realized what a cool guitarist Earl Slick was. Mm-hmm. Until I met him and and hear the stripped down double fantasy, and I've always been a massive Tony Levin fan. Mm-hmm. It was a great band, and you get that comes through on the stripped down version of Double Fantasy, and Hugh McCracken too, one yeah. of the greatest session yeah. guitar players. Want to jump off Double Fantasy just for a second? You know, Double Fantasy was conceived as being the first part of uh, John and Yoko's heart play. Uh, Their wheels were already uh, in motion for there to be the sequel, Milk and Honey. Uh, And the pieces were already in place for the next album. Uh, There was also talk of a solo Yoko Ono album, whether or not Walking on Thin Ice was going to be part of the album or not. I don't know. But there was a few things that were discussed that could very well have happened in 1981. One of the more common things is hearing that Milk and Honey would have come out. And then with those two albums, Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey, John and Yoko were going to tour. Okay. As we know, there was definite, there was definite talk that they were going to tour. Yeah. Right. We all know that the best laid plans got thrown out and Milk and Honey didn't come out until January, 1984 a little over three years after Double Fantasy. And it definitely lost a lot of luster. Uh, and, you know, it it came off more as a sad event as opposed to what we probably would have thought of Milk and Honey had it come out the way John and Yoko would have liked mm-hmm. as a, a fresh continuation uh, of what we had heard perhaps just months earlier. Your take of Milk and Honey, mainly the fact that John's the material, of course, was raw because it, the six songs uh, were never completed in the studio. There was still work to be done. Uh, and Grow Old With Me was a still in demo form. What are your thoughts on Milk and Honey taking into consideration that John's material was still raw and unfinished? But Yoko went ahead and finished off and polished up her six songs in many ways, the way Double Fantasy was um, linked conceptually, Milk and Honey is disjointed sounding. Would you agree with that? Ken? I would I would agree. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good point that you're bringing up there, Darren. But I, where, where John's uh, material is concerned, I grew to love those recordings as they were. And even though you've said that those songs were unfinished, I, I honestly think that, you know, nobody told me it was perfect the way that it is. Yeah, you know, they were and, close. I think they were close to being finished. But, you know, yeah. there was probably still a little studio polish uh, that would have been put on them, you know, had they had that opportunity in, I don't know, 1981. You um, know, in a way, since we brought up Stripped Down, the way that Milk and Honey came across is probably more, if you, if you prefer the Stripped Down approach, that's what Milk and Honey was. I mean, but still as rehearsals where they're really good takes, but not absolutely perfect, they're fine. And a lot of people love them just the way they are. I mean, I I don't think I'd change a thing about stepping out or even I don't want to face it and borrow time as songs. But, um, you know, if you want a more loose approach where it's not absolutely perfect and not completely polished, then the songs on Milk and Honey could do that for you. Although in this case, Unfortunately, Grow Old With Me was never done in the studio. Mm-hmm. Forgive me, My Little Flower Princess, though, really is. It's the only song that I feel compositionally 
was not finished. You know, there was still some work to be done on that song. That's my personal opinion. But um, yeah, I, I understand what you said, and I agree about it being disjointed, although I like Yoko's material on, on Milk and Honey too. But it does sound very finished, very complete, you know, like it was really, do we, you know, yeah. Do we know if um, those six songs of Yoko's existed in late 80, uh, if they were songs that were already, you know, part of the foundation of uh, Milk and Honey, or were they six songs that Yoko wrote and uh, basically cooked up after John's murder? I actually don't know the answer to that. Do you, Alan? I don't either, but the players uh, are... Well, we don't know that the players on her tracks are necessarily the same. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I've always assumed that they were also in progress at the time, but I don't know why I assume that. Maybe I'm wrong. It's an interesting thing to look that into. A, yeah, that was something, though, I think that, you know, that I don't really falter. Uh, I don't criticize her all that strongly about it. But I think it's sort of uh, messed up for the the vibe of what double uh, milk and honey could have been whether or not she didn't have the, you know, her songs are polished. Her songs are finished. John's aren't. They're also disjointed thematically, whereas double fantasy, all the songs, you know, locked together. Makes me off actually wish in a way that milk and honey was released as an all John album of these unreleased songs and maybe some alternate takes of double fantasy tracks. And Yoko did, you know, saves her six songs for, you know, her own album. But anyway, I'm, you know, now I'm splitting hairs. And However, uh, Let Me Count the Ways was written before John wrote Grow Old With Me. And okay. since they were both fans of Robert uh, Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, you know, those two songs seg perfectly together. And in fact, you know, Yoko's recording of Let Me Count the Ways she made it like a piano demo to go right into John's recording. Well, that would, I guess, be the one exception. Yeah. Because the rest of the record, just a collection of songs. But that's something that always, just always struck me that Milk and Honey wasn't, well, for many reasons, but wasn't really what it could have been. Um, because that, I remember the anticipation of the next album, is coming the sequel or what could have been the sequels a double fantasy and then getting it and loving john's songs and i like yoko's too i didn't think they were as strong as the seven on double fantasy but ultimately feeling like it's a letdown after what double fantasy was which was such a strong record in so many ways hmm. i still love the songs especially that john did on milk and honey and um you know, if anything, it was an indication that he had more strong material coming. Right. So, yeah, um, song per song, there's a lot more great material from John and Yoko on Double Fantasy. But I don't think John Lennon's catalog is complete without those six songs from John on Milk and Honey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually would love to hear more from those sessions, and maybe we will someday. You know, and and maybe questions like are Yoko songs like Sleepless Night and Oh Sanity, are they songs that originated from the double fantasy sessions with a late 70s compositions of Yoko's and give us an opportunity to hear Nobody Told Me being worked on in the same session, a cleanup time, maybe I'm pulling songs out of thin air were worked on, you know, so maybe someday we'll get that uh Double Fantasy Milk and Honey Sessions box set, which I think would be a great listen. Yeah, it, oh, could, yeah. Have been, it could have been very different if they had sequenced, say, um, I'm losing you and I'm moving on and then put I'm stepping out after that. <laughs> could have been just thematically. A bit <laughs> That's different. good. Uh, you know, who knows who they, they, they may have thought of it uh, and rejected it. But uh, yeah, uh, Milk and Honey... Yeah, obviously it it never was going to sound as good as as Double Fantasy, but I think I think at the time I at least just accepted it as unfinished, you know, or as finished as they could get it. I mean, there were a couple of places you thought maybe he could go in and and uh, do a better vocal, 
but uh, you know, it's it is it is what it is. Uh, grow old with me, you know. Again, it's a demo, and um, nobody told me I thought could use. He he probably would have sung it again if if he were alive. I think that was probably more of a scratch vocal. Pretty damn good scratch vocal. It's a pretty good. I'm sitting. Yeah, yeah. I think he could have done better though, and I think he would have wanted to. But who knows? You know, maybe, maybe he can. I mean, st I'm stepping out. Sounds totally finished to me. So, yeah, it was a bonus, and it was you know a while later. But I think you know everyone sort of understood that this wasn't going to be finished stuff. It was going to be in progress. But we were lucky to hear it. And to me, Grow All With Me is such a tearjerker. And uh, the fact that he wasn't around to do that one properly in the studio, what a crime. Yeah. You know? And I do like the, the version that came out um, on the John Lennon anthology with George Martin and Giles Martin adding orchestration. And they just uh, put out a new version on the Give Me Some Truth uh, compilation, mm -hmm. which sounds like different takes of Grohl with me mixed with the orchestration that was used from the John Lennon anthology. So, but yeah, I'm glad that a few, a few people have covered grow old with me. Cause that's a song that should be noticed in John's catalog as, as one of his best and a perfect wedding song. It was for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, I actually had four wedding songs, one from each Beatle and the one from John that we picked was grow old with me. So, yeah. Could I ask one question to the two of you? Mm -hmm. uh, no. We know, <laughs> we know that kidding. there are those, those two versions of I'm Losing You. There's the one with two of the guys from Cheap Trick, Rick Nilsson and Bunny Carlos, mm -hmm. plus the right. version that we all know from Double Fantasy. Do either of you have a preference between the two? I prefer the one on Double Fantasy, but I like the, the Cheap Trick one, too. Uh, I, I can see why he chose the one he chose, though. Yeah. I mean, there were stories there shortly after about Yoko feeling that the guys from Cheap Trick were just sort of like trying to ride on John's coattails because she didn't quite get that at the time they were quite huge. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I think she came around because when they put out uh, one of those box sets, I think the John Lennon anthology probably. Uh, yep. And, and, you, she used that track. She also had them come to make a video. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a great alternative. Um, but I think he was right to go with the one he put on the album. Mm. Yeah, I agree. My uh, my opinion is the same. I mean, it wouldn't have fit. I mean, for consistency's sake, you know, everything on Double Fantasy that we have now is the same band. To have one track, maybe a second with uh, another backing group you know, kind of would have broke the cohesion. But I thought it was a great match, John and Cheap Trick. Uh, do we know if they any other songs they worked on in the studio? I think they also worked on uh, uh, Moving On. Hmm. With Yoko, Yoko and Cheap Trick? Uh-huh. Okay. Because it's, so. it, it's, it, it's a good pairing. It makes total sense to have hmm. John and them together. Oh, I agree. You know, the thing that I remember reading, I think this was in Ken Sharp's book of starting over, that um, Rick Nielsen wanted to give the song more of a plastic on a band feel. And I think that it certainly he succeeded in doing just that. And John seemed to like it a lot. But I think that, you know, for consistency with the sound of Double Fantasy, it worked better. The other version, which had more polish to it, but still a lot of bite. You know, right. So, um, yeah, but I love both versions. I like having that, you know, the choice of picking between the two. The, the question is, why didn't they bring in the B-52s to back Yoko on, you know, Kiss, Kiss, Kiss or something? <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> that okay. could have been a good single, a good non-LP single, two songs from the LP, but different recordings with different backing groups and have, have Yoko in the B-52s, John and Cheap Trick. Well, that just about wraps up our discussion of Double Fantasy 40 years later. Uh, we're well aware of the fact that the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album turned 50 just about a month ago. But with the um, prospects of a John Lennon Plastic Ono Band 
box set, actually, that sounds like it's going to be very substantial in its contents. We'll be, uh, I'm sure, spending an extended period of time discussing that album uh, on a future show and a future edition of Things We Said Today. We have the book to go along with the upcoming box set. The book came out, and uh, we will, uh, I think, on our next show, maybe uh, delve in a bit. I just got my copy. I really haven't spent any time with the Plastic Ono Band book. But um, knowing the box set for Plastic Ono Band, the album was coming Uh, We did definitely want to not overlook the 40th anniversary of uh, another critical work in John Lennon's career, Double Fantasy. So we'd love to know your opinions of Yoko stuff, of John stuff, your first impressions upon hearing the uh, the album in late 1980. Did your opinions change as uh, time went on Uh, and uh, what you think about the album in, well, early 2021, 40 years later. Double Fantasy from John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And with that, time to uh, begin wrapping things up on things we said today. So uh, let's go over to Alan and uh, get Alan's contact information and other assorted wonders. Okay. Um, You can reach me very easily on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, You can reach all of us uh, by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's things we said today radio show, all one word, at gmail.com. We have a Twitter page, uh, a Twitter feed, uh, which is at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, a group Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And also there's one that is just Things We Said Today. All righty. Let's swing on over to Ken Michaels. Okay. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly by email, my address is everylittlething at att.net. You can check out my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com, with lots of interviews with people connected to the Beatles and Weekly Beatles Trivia. I'm hoping very soon to have copies to give away of McCartney 3. So uh, be on the lookout for that on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. <laughs> it's probably going to be just the typical CD boring one. <laughs> But it's the music that matters first, Alan. Remember that. Yes, of course. Not the color of the vinyl or the CD. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, so that'll be coming soon on the website. Don't forget my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did our own review of McCartney 3. Our next show, which is Monday on January the 11th, we're going to be doing our own uh, CD that we're compiling together of the best of McCartney, McCartney 2, and McCartney 3, putting it all together at one CD. If that's even possible, it'll be uh, interesting to know what the other co-hosts will be doing and selecting for that. Kid O'Toole, Tom Unyadi, Joe Mayo, also known as me, Mr. Mayo, possibly Ken Womack on the show. That'll be next Monday, January the 11th, 9 p.m. Eastern, on our uh, Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And while I have the chance, just want to remind everybody that um, for this show, Things We Said Today, for Talk More Talk, and also my own personal YouTube page, Ken Michaels Radio, you can subscribe to all three of them. When you go to YouTube, you want to subscribe to all three. So if you can, Please uh, do so for all three shows. And there's uh, interviews that I've done on my YouTube page with people like Mark Hudson and Joey Molland. Be sure to check that out on uh, Ken Michaels Radio. And I think that covers it. All right. And as for me, uh, you can email me at WFUV. It's my name, Darren DeVivo, at WFUV.org. If you'd like to go to Facebook, I have two pages. You could send me a friend request to Darren DeVivo. And your other option, well, I'd love you to join me in both places. My other page is called Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer, and there, click like. 
And uh, the content on the two pages is similar, but not necessarily exactly the same. Someday I will figure out, uh, you know, how to make each page sort of unique. But uh, go to Facebook and uh, send me a friend request. Click like on the other page. Email. And uh, as for listening on WFUV, I'm back on the air after my battle with COVID-19 and taking the holidays off. You could catch me Monday through Thursday nights from 10 p.m. to 12 midnight, a pandemic abbreviated show. Normally I'd be on till 2 a.m., uh, but for logistical reasons, uh, which are a little over my head, technical reasons were broadcasting remotely. Uh, my show had to be trimmed from four hours to two hours, 10 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Thursday nights. And then Saturday afternoons, I'm on from one to four. That's 90.7 FM in New York City. Uh, we're actually, for those of you who still listen or check out HD, we're at 90.7 FM HD2. And anywhere on the globe, you can listen at WFUV.org or download the WFUV app. And uh, that's all for me. So uh, for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeViva. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks with our second show for 2021. This is Things We Said Today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.